Not used to this room, no but welcome everyone to the first Build Lash Fashion Design Speakers of the 2023-2024 um, school year. The series was established nearly 20 years ago thanks to the generosity of Who's Your Fashion Designer Bill Blass. The Fort Wayne native became one of the 20th century's most recognized fashion names and faces with his menswear inspired suits and coats, elegant evening wear, and beaded and sequined coats and jackets. Former Associate Dean of the Eskenazi School of Art, Architecture, and Design and Sage Collection Curator and Director Kate Rowald worked very closely with Mr. Blass on the only Bill Blass retrospective to date at the IU Art Museum in 2002, now the Eskenazi Museum of Art. Unfortunately, Mr. Blass was not around to see the exhibition, but passed away a few months prior to its opening. A generous request from Mr. Blass now funds Sage Collection Operations and Projects, a Blass Scholarship, Student Projects, and the Speaker Series. Joan Hart is an internationally recognized specialist on cashmere and paisley shawls whose research has been published in the Digital Archives of the Textile Society of America. She consults with and lends to museums from her large collection of shawls, couture fashion, robes from around the world, and Syrian apparel. With a PhD in art history from the University of California, Berkeley, and a BA from Swarthmore College, Hart has taught at Indiana University, Purdue University, and Wabash College, among others. She is currently finishing a book on the founding art historian Heinrich Wolfelin for a British press. She has lectured at the Louvre Museum in Paris, the Russian Academy of Art in Moscow, and many other venues. She currently resides in California and is on the board of the Textile Arts Council of the San Francisco Museum of Fine Art. Please join me in welcoming Joan Hart back to Bloomington. So do you think you would like to use this? <laughs> Flip it on to you. Yep. Better you than I. All right. I'm not, I, this is not my forte, so no. I'm going to try it out. Okay, that sounds. Does it sound good, everyone? Yep. Yes. All we right, we're you. we're on a, on the march. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and do you are do you want a clicker? Are you are you a walker arounder? Oh. Uh, uh, you tell me what to do and I'll do it. I get, you know, I, I usually use those. Uh, clicker is fine. Right. Yep, That's works well. There you go. All right, thank you, dear. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. I think I know just about everyone in the audience, so it's so lovely to see you all. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Kelly, in particular, for making this happen. Uh, you see how hard she works. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Uh, okay, so Queen Victoria the Sultan and the Adventure, weaving the history of the cashmere shawl. So I've got uh, two maps of India that I wanted to show you so you know where cashmere is. Uh, thinking about cashmere and its products tonight. It's in the far north of India, bordering China, Nepal, and Tibet. It's the only Muslim majority state in India. It has seen its measure of warfare, but it has also been an isolated paradise, home to beautiful lakes, waterways, mountains, incredible scenic beauty. And just as a forecast of what we're going to be talking about tonight, um, Srinagar over here is the capital of Kashmir, and this shows a schematic view of the, cash, of the routes that uh, merchants and people uh, use to uh, carry shawls around uh, in big bales. Are we having another problem? I just don't want you to do it. Oh, yeah, thank you. All right, <clears throat> I'll just keep talking. Um, so anyway, so you have a view of, of the uh, shawl routes and uh, how they took these shawls uh, that we'll be discussing to Russia, Iran, um, the Caucasus, Turkey. They were popular all over the world, basically, China as well. And there are two views of the Jhelum River that flows through the capital of Srinagar. You can see a photo from the 1960s when it was a relatively peaceful and beautiful place. And the water figures highly actually in the shawl trade because they needed to wash out the paste after they wove them, and the Jhelum River has very pure and great water, apparently. 
and here's another view of Srinagar and its beauty. Unfortunately, Kashmir is now the most militarized place in the world. After years of conflict between Pakistan and India, the current Prime Minister Modi has occupied the state. But we will be looking at the past major production of Kashmir, its thriving shawl industry, one among many of the arts of the area, which included lacquerware, jewelry, and rugs. This is a painting from the 18th century of a gentleman wearing some of the earliest types of shawls. Um, and you might note that he, the shawls that he's wearing over his shoulder are double. They're two shawls. They were always made in pairs, something that will come up uh, later in my talk. Um, and this is typical Indian apparel for hundreds of years, <laughs> um, which I won't talk about except in regard to the shawls. Uh, and the shawl that you're seeing is measures probably around four feet by eight feet. They were always very, very large and long. Kashmir shawls have a long history, beginning most likely in the 14th and 15th centuries and continuing to the present with their most notable period from the late 18th century to the end of the 19th century. This is a photo of one of my favorite shawl borders that dates from the 17th century. Uh, these early shawls, you may know, is probably a rose bush. It looks like a rose bush. They never lined up things in a linear fashion. The uh, rows are always staggered. They liked asymmetry in all things. Um, and it's made out of pure cashmere, the finest cashmere um, that exist, existed ever uh, in this particular shawl. Throughout their history, um, <clears throat> the shawls always figured prominently in the economic, aesthetic, and political lives of the Kashmiri people. During the time of the Mughal Emperor, from 1527 to 1763, the emperors established workshops for the manufacture of the shawls that were highly prized, worn by the emperor, and given as honorary presents for courtiers and honored guests. Another Raj, or ruler, Queen Victoria, used the shawl in a similar way. About a decade ago, I purchased a shawl that belonged to Queen Victoria. And this is a picture of the shawl in the background. Um, what you're seeing here is a shawl displayed at the Ashmolean Museum in Oxford University and an exhibition called The Color Revolution, Victorian Art, Fashion, and Design. That's where it is right now. It's encased in a glass cage in the back with several other items I lent to the exhibition, like this dress uh, that's based, that has a design based on a cashmere shawl from the 1830s, um, a gentleman's smoking jacket based, uh, made out of a shawl from Scotland from the 1850s with a smoking hat from Turkey. <laughs> The shawl, unfortunately, was placed in the rear to prevent fading based on museum norms for exhibiting, exhibiting textiles. But here it is in the best kind of photograph you can possibly get of it. Um, what you're seeing is the half of the shawl. Um, it's about 5 feet by 12 feet long. Um, it was made toward the very end of the cashmere shawl production in 1870. How do we know it was made for Queen Victoria? The dealer from whom I purchased it, the shawl, gave me a photograph and indicated that it was the identical shawl, which is in the Victorian Albert Museum in London, and was a gift for Queen Victoria. Remember, I mentioned that the shawls were handmade and always made in pairs. It's extremely rare to have any information on the provenance of where these shawls came from. So I checked with the museum, and sure enough, they have the identical shawl, and it was given to the museum by a woman who received it from one of Queen Victoria's sons who got it from his mother. So when Queen Victoria was intent on promoting only British-made clothing, why did she have any cashmere shawls? The answer is not to be expected. When the British defeated the Sikhs in 1846 in India, they signed the Treaty of Amritsar, which established peace and handed over rule of Kashmir to the new Dagra prince, Raja Gulab Singh. After thus securing Kashmir's independence, the prince was required to pay a yearly tribute to the British government that included a horse, 12 shawl goats that provided the wool for shawls, 
and three pairs of cashmere shawls. The British didn't know what to do with these shawls and decided to give them to Queen Victoria. Hence, every year after 1846, she received three pairs of shawls, um, and this is one that she, uh, one of many that she received. She does not appear to have worn any of them. I have yet to see a photograph of her um, wearing any of them. Um, oh gosh, there are many pictures of shawls that I forgot to show you in my excitement here. Uh, this is the center of the Queen Victoria shawl. Uh, this is the lower half of it, and you can see the use of aniline um, dyes, very bright colored dyes that were available in 1870 when it was made. And here's another photo of the interior of it. Note all the colors. And that's really a nice photo of it. Um, it's really a cool shawl. Um, so this is the photo I was leading up to. So you see Queen Victoria seated on the left with one of her children, a ghostly white bust of Prince Albert, her beloved husband who's now deceased among them. Um, it's a wet wedding photograph of Prince Edward and uh, Alexandra of Denmark uh, seated behind the queen. And across from her is a woman seated with a bonnet and a big shawl around her. That is a cashmere shawl. It's not my cashmere shawl, but it's probably one of the shawls she got. It appears to be a square embroidered shawl with figures on it. So you see that Queen Victoria regularly probably gave these shawls to her children and her friends, and now some have ended up in museums and private collections. And here it is again. Um, the shawl weavers undoubtedly knew that the shawl was destined for the British Queen, and it exhibits an extraordinary amount of color, weaving expertise, and embroidery throughout. Normally, shawls of 1870 might have 10 colors and were either woven or embroidered, although a new kind of shawl was being made at this time called the Daruka. And this is a, an image, a rather bad image of the Daruka. Um, it was made out of uh, a very weak weave, uh, these shawls were, these late ones, and a, a poor quality of cashmere. So they were embroidered throughout. You can see a detail here. Um, it was woven with many colors, and then you see the contouring in purple and red throughout. So the embroidery was added later, probably uh, partly because it looks quite beautiful, but also to add more stability to the shawl. Nonetheless, they are very weak, these shawls, um, and fall apart fairly regularly. And again, you see the use of aniline dyes throughout um, because the shawl dates from a later date. Queen Victoria's shawl is different, however. Not only are there more colors in the shawl, someone counted 24 and then gave up, but the weave is a double tapestry twill, interlocked tapestry twill technique. And to top it off, the shawl is constructed of small pieces of woven fragment which are stitched together, so it's not all one single weave. Um, so here you see a detail and you probably can make out some of the embroidery in it if you uh, look closely. And here's an image of it close to the center of the shawl where you see a display of many colors. And then this one, I have my old fashioned pointer here. Uh, you can see where these two pieces were bound together probably all along this ridge. So this is one piece of weaving here, and you can see the embroidery throughout, and this is all woven through here. But what's really fascinating to me about this is that, um, you know, the, the interlock tapestry twill creates this diagonal, and usually when they piece the shawls, the diagonals wouldn't line up, so they hang really badly. This one, they're all lined up. It's really amazing. <laughs> so they really worked hard on getting this one together appropriately. <clears throat> um, the diagonal um, pattern occurs in twill weave because the weft or horizontal yarn, oh, let's see, I missed the diagram. Okay, this is a diagram of the double interlock tapestry twill weave which is called Espeline in French. Um, 
And you see the uh, warp threads are red in the diagram, and the rest are all weft threads. Um, so the reason it's called this double interlock, as you can see, is because uh, the weft or horizontal yarn thread over and under every two warp threads or, or yarn, moving successfully, successively one, one row over uh, for each one, so they line up in a diagonal. The casual weavers integrated colored patterns into the twill weave by hand, linking adja adjacent colors twice, uh, hence the double interlock. It forms a really tight and strong weave, which appears uh, seamless on the front. Let's see, and here's the back. Um, the image of the reverse of the shawl shows that the weavers inserted the pattern by hand and moved one thread from one area to another without clipping it off. So that's why it's such a mess on the back. <laughs> uh, and if you look on the far uh, left-hand corner, that white area, you can see the embroidery threads showing through. Um, they left the back quite messy, so that's one of the ways you can tell it's a cashmere shawl as opposed to a jack-hard woven shawl or something else. And that's the seal of Queen Victoria, we believe, on that shawl, many of them. So this is a reverse of the shawl, showing again where the piecing took place. And you can see it on the several borders of the shawl, and then in the center fold um, of the shawl. And this is the front of that similar piece of the front of the shawl. And it's very difficult to see where the seaming takes place um, in it. You have to look at it with a magnifying glass to really make it out. So it's a very complicated shawl. Pieced, woven, embroidered, so on. Um, so, our perception of this shawl is curious, a counterpoint to Impressionist paintings of the time. Seen from a distance, the shawl appears brown and a bit muddy. Our eyes cannot compute the numerous individual colors that are closely juxtaposed across the surface of the shawl. The colors combine into a dark surface, unlike Impressionist paintings that often become more realistic and comprehensible from a distance. The shawl becomes more visible when seen close up, as in this image. As you come closer and closer to the surface, colors emerge, as do patterns and weave structures. So contrary to the Impressionist paintings, the shawl is much more visible when we are very close to it, which is kind of unfortunate for the visitors to the current show at the Asheville Land Museum, as they will not get close to it. But, as noted, in exchange for the independence of Kashmir from the British crown, the Dogger Prince gave tribute to the Queen and the British government with shawls, goats, and horses. Not gold, not diamonds, not rubies, but shawls and the goats whose finely, fine underbelly wool was the fabric of the shawl. Think about that for a moment. <laughs> The prestige of these luxurious and gaily colored shawls was such that kingdoms could be bought with them. By 1846, the cashmere shawls had been a highly valued commodity in Europe for European women for 60 years. In India, they were made primarily by men for men to wear. In Europe, they arrived serendipitously when women's fashion was unusually sparse and light in the form of low-cut muslin and silk short-sleeved gowns. The shawls were no, no doubt welcome warmth in cold, drafty buildings. This is one of my favorite images of women wearing shawls in France. It's a painting by Isabelle, who uh, was a great artist, but also a great designer of shawls. And it's called the Grand Staircase of the Musée Napoleon, which is now the Louvre Museum. And if you know the Louvre, you might see in the background two statues by Michelangelo that are now back in that same court, I believe. Uh, what you see is an encounter between a heavily adorned in shawls Indian gentleman uh, meeting up with two pairs of couples, two men uh, who are clearly soldiers, and their, their gals who are um, thoroughly dressed in uh, shawl, beautiful shawls from the period of 1800-1804. This is a painting by the famous Jacques-Louis David of a friend of his, Comtesse of Sorcy, 
from 1790, one of the earliest French paintings we have of someone wearing the shawl. Um, you can see again that it's a very flexible looking thing, uh, very long. She's draped it all over her Muslim uh, work dress, it looks like. Um, quite beautiful. And I couldn't resist showing you this cartoon of the time <laughs> about the costume of women. Um, bombazine was a, f a fabulous black a material, mainly black, that was made for morning dress in the 18th century. So you see juxtaposed the lady in the former dress and in 1807 what the Muslim dresses look like. Um, only she's not bombazine, but bombazine. So anyway, how do you get a kick out of that? Uh, and, the, and here we have uh, Empress Josephine, the wife of Napoleon, first wife of Napoleon. She was a great collector of shawls, and this is a painting by Gro. She has turned a wonderful early cashmere shawl into a dress, and then she's got a red one wrapped around her, and uh, looks very stately. She really established the shawl as a luxury item in France. The shawls were so beloved that they became embedded in European culture for a century. Initially, they were a requirement for a woman's dowry, along with jewelry, money, clothing. Different types of shawls were worn to church, others for weddings, for everyday wear, and so on. Part of the charm of the shawl was undoubtedly its contrast to everyday wear for women. Like Queen Victoria, they were often wearing black morning dress because mortality was so high. Having a large, warm, and colorful shawl prized in oriental in design surely was a cheering thing. It's difficult to comprehend how valued the shawls were until one reads Balzac's cousin Bet, Flaubert's sentimental education, Thackeray's Vanity Fair, or Wilkie Collins' Armadol. Stories revolving around shawl envy and the dastardly things people would do to obtain a new cashmere shawl that were, these stories were very popular in the 19th century. The thrill of empire no doubt played a role in their popularity. India was the jewel and the crown of empire. The Mughal Empire, which the British East India Company basically decimated over a period of 70 years, was the wealthiest on earth at the time. The British stripped the country of its good throughout its anarchic rule. It played well back home in London, where the display of luxury goods was celebrated. The shawls were a kind of trophy, a display of the conquest of India. The shawls have been interpreted in two ways, at least I do, as material objects beautifully crafted and as emblems of India's riches, of the conquest of India, as trophies of war, as exemplars of luxury. Meanwhile, an entire European industry of shawl manufacturers rose in the late 18th century. When the jacquard loom was invented in the early 19th century, a component of the Industrial Revolution, the shawl industry burgeoned, making accessible reproduction shawls to most middle class women. But through it all, the hand woven cashmere shawls retained their prominence as the penultimate desirable commodity. This is a um, watercolor, I believe, of the um, London Crystal Palace Universal Exhibition of Foreign Goods of 1851 in Hyde Park in London. And note, if you look closely, almost every woman in there is wearing a shawl. <laughs> uh, these exhibitions took place every few years in some place around Europe. Uh, the 1851 one is probably the most famous, partly because it was designed by Prince Albert. Um, but it, was, it provided a means to stimulate the passion for the shawls and competition among designers, manufacturers, and countries for awards on their, based on their patterns. With increasing machine production of shawls in Europe, the Indian weavers had to compete more, weaving more fantastical and grander shawls for expert, export. The shawl production was influenced by the colonial powers that imported them, reproduced them, and transformed them from a specific object of respect, political power, and largesse to a consumer good desired by many. 
Having viewed the final development of the shawl through examination of Queen Victoria's in all its exuberant and <coughs> vibrant color, its peculiar and difficult construction, its visual comprehension, you might be wondering how this fantastic and complex textile developed. So here's a synopsis of the shawls through the century. Cashmere shawls have several distinct and unique characteristics, despite the huge variation of, in them over time. From the mobile period on, they were made from varying qualities of pashmina wool <clears throat> that were collected from the underbelly of these goats and antelopes from Tibet, one of which you see here, a shaggy character. Um, this is an image of a painting from 17th century India showing the goats uh, out in the yard. I think it's quite charming. And I love this photograph. What you see here are Tibetans who come down from the Himalayas uh, with their, um, their packages of un the, un the cashmere uh, wool to trade with the Indians who had a lock on the trade monopoly on the uh, cashmere wool. The shawls also uh, consistently are made, uh, have patterns of uh, paisley or bodas, um, which you'll see in a minute, which grew in flamboyance over time. Designs, as I mentioned before, are always non-linear, always with staggered rows of flowers in the early period. Colors derived from organic materials, but most distinctive, the most distinctive trait of the shawls is the method of weaving, which I explained before, the tapestry tool weave, with colored yarn or bobbin or connie, which you see in this image, um, those little uh, wooden things that uh, the chap is using to slide the colors into the uh, warp. Um, that was the typical uh, method of making the shawls. As the design and construction of the shawls changed from the 1700s to the late 19th century, this particular time-consuming and difficult weave was a constant almost to the end. This is one of the earliest shawls in my collection with a rare provenance dating from the 18th century and possibly earlier. The shawl is a cashmere long shawl. It has a golden ground that's very worn, as you can see, it's pulling apart in the center. It's complete, however, with two borders and seven rows of staggered flowers, which you can see in this image. Um, and here's a nice close-up view where you can see that it's the little sprig of flowers are pink, white, and indigo <laughs> with staggered rows. <laughs> the hoshes or uh, border areas that you see uh, at the top and bottom um, you can date shawls from those as well. And, um, anyway, the colors are indigo again and red. This is how the shawl appeared in a British auction with four documents. The most important of these documents is a damaged 18th century letter that you see on the top. It's a story of how Thomas Astley received the shawl at the Siege of Mangalore in 1784. The 18th century letter has missing pieces, but it states, quote, at the Siege of Mangalore in the East Indies by Tibu Sahib, the garrison, which originally consisted of 2,000 men, was reduced by disease and famine to 200. When fortunately peace was proclaimed and the gallant remains of the British forces marched out of the fortress with all the honors of war. On this glorious occasion, Mr. Thomas Astley's surgeon, one of the survivors, whom his extraordinary professional, and there's a gap in the writing, received the particular attentions of Tipu Sahib, who addressing him said, Young gentlemen, you look exceedingly ill. Take this scarf. <laughs> the, the rest of the letter is illegible, sadly, but the most important bit is there. The great warrior, Tipu Sultan, gave the shawl to Thomas Astley, probably because surgeons were highly prized on all sides during warfare in India. 
Having this providence is fantastic. There's little known about who owned most shawls at any date. The fact that this one is said to have been owned by one of the great heroes of Indian history, a brilliant militarist against the British and the, their East India Company, named Tipu Sultan, is very surprising. And here's a painting of Tipu Sultan <coughs> in his lifetime, 1790. Tipu Sultan ruled the kingdom of Mysore in southern India from 1782 to 1799 and was known as the Tiger of Mysore. The kingdom was one of the wealthiest and most modern of the great principalities of India in the Mughal period. As ru ruler, Tipu Sultan initiated changes in the silk industry, coinage, the calendar, military equipment, among others, to make Mysore a very productive and prosperous area. He hated the British for stripping other areas of their wealth and succeeded in preventing it from happening in Mysore for a very long time. He was well-educated and the son of a military hero. With the collapse of the Mughal Empire, the various kingdoms of India became independent entities, forming alliances sometimes with European governments. Tipu Sultan formed an alliance with the French against the British East India Company and won many battles until he was finally killed by them in 1799. The British military stripped his palace of his automaton and all that was of value. Some of the loot is now in the Victoria and Albert Museum, like the automaton. The tiger was emblazoned on his military uniforms and painted throughout his glorious palace. This almost life-size automaton is the best-known possession of Tipu Sultan. The tiger, as you can see, is attacking a British soldier. When the crank is turned, see the crank on the shoulder of the tiger, um, groans of the soldier and the tiger's howl emanate from the interior as the soldier raises his arm in protest. The exterior is typical of Indian folk art, but the interior was designed by French engineers, and it was the most innovative technology of the day, a precise mechanical sound machine with arm movement. And there's a new book about this very thing called Lute, if you're interested in reading more about Tipu Sultan, uh, which I highly recommend. The unbridled corruption of the British East India Company was not ignored by caricatures of the day. <clears throat> this is one by James Gilmore called uh, The Leaden Hall Volunteer, dressed in his shawl of 1797. EIC stands for East India Company, which you see across his hat. Leaden Hall was the little office in London that was the home of the British East India Company. And you see a teapot on it, all the things that they were taking out of India, the tea. He's got a diamond on his little pinky. And in the background, you see Golconda on the hillside, which is where they sourced diamonds. And he's got the shawl, of course. Um, and next to him is a rather angry looking elephant, the symbol of India. I couldn't resist showing you this. I think Tipu Sultan must have had a marvelous sense of humor. I love the tiger with <laughs> as a, the cannonball coming out of his mouth. Um, and that's still in India. And this is his military outfit, um, which is still in the Victoria and Albert Museum. They found some wonderful shawl material lining this robe, uh, which helps us date further some of the shawls. We ha now have rare, well-established established provenance. Um, for two shawls. One at the end of shawl production, belonging to Queen Victoria, and the other at the early stage of development, belonging to Tipu Sultan. We have little in the way of further written records about shawls, although museums sometimes record the names and dates of donors, which helps somewhat with dating. Beginning in the late 18th century, the shawls began to enter England and France as presents by Napoleon soldiers to their wives and girlfriends and by merchants who then had artists like Jacques-Louis David or Ang paint their portraits. 
Hence, we know the evolution of the shawl patterns in the late 18th century and early 19th century. Uh, here's probably the earliest painting I found yet of people wearing the shawls. This one is a Scottish painting from 1780. And you see the older woman on the left wearing a rather old-fashioned costume from earlier in the 18th century, but encased in her beautiful cashmere shawl. Her two daughters are dressed in the more popular uh, Bumby scene kind of dress <laughs> with shawls wrapped around their waist and so on, so more dramatic kind of uh, picturing of them. And this is Ang's famous painting of Madame Riviere with her glorious cashmere shawl. Um, this painting is from 1804 or so. Uh, so we have a good dating, and there were tons of these paintings made. This is one that I own, um, anonymous artist, uh, with a beautifully um, portrayed shawl wrapped around her. These portraits were extremely popular all over the globe. In Germany, not too long ago, they had an exhibition just of portraits of women wearing the shawls. <laughs> it was a huge exhibition. Um, so it's wonderful to have this record. But there's another source of information about the shawl production in Kashmir by one who traveled to Kashmir and the surrounding regions. We know a lot about Kashmir from this period, despite its total isolation through this unique source. A Brit by the name of William Moorcroft, who lived from 1767 to 1825, gave the best accounts of shawl production in the early years of the 19th century. He was quite a, an incredible person. This is a watercolor of Moorcroft and his friend um, on the left, uh, disguised as Indians, going through Tibet. And they're encountering on their right two Tibetans with a uh, yak laden with their goods. This was painted in 1812 by hearsay. Um, you can't really tell which one is Moorcroft. He painted them both pretty much the same. So. At any rate, you see what he, he kind of looked like. Moorcroft was born in rural England to an unwed mother, but demonstrated great abilities and character as a child. His success at treating sick animals at the local farms led the local land owners to offer to finance his education in France to become a veterinary surgeon. Moorcroft was the first Briton to become a professional veterinarian, training in Lyon in the first such school for veterinarians in the revolutionary year of 1789. He returned to London and made a very good living caring for horses, established a hospital for horses on Oxford Street, helped found the first British veterinary college, and proposed new surgical methods for curing lameness in horses. However, in 1808, he gave it up, the business, his family, his two sons, and was recruited to go to Bengal in India to find the best horses for the fighting forces of the British East India Company. That was a very difficult mission in Bengal, and he was traveling constantly to find better stock for his stables. He led expeditions often to places where Europeans had never been, Tibet, Nepal, Bukhara, Kashmir, many other places. His last trek in the 1820s included 300 assistants 4,000 pounds worth of material to bribe the dangerous leaders of the places he visited. And he survived these encounters for providing surgical procedures. Apparently, cataract surgery was very popular among people at that time. But he was often forced to remain in towns for years before lawless tribal leaders would allow him to leave. During his travels in the Himalayas and in the region, he became fascinated with the shawl production and endeavored to become a merchant in that field himself. He left us unique rec written record of the cashmere shawl industry of the time and six gesso paintings of shawl designs by shawl producers from 1823. So here you see on the left one of the gesso designs Somehow they ended up in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Um, and one of my shawls that has a very similar design. So because they were painted in 1823, we know that the shawls that look like them
came from around that period or earlier. So this is one of the gessos on the left. Here's another one on the left with juxtaposed with another shawl, border um, of a cashmere shawl. And here's yet another one. Um, so those are three of the shawl borders uh, which he brought back. Moorcroft described in a little book the shawl production in detail. Financiers who bought the raw materials and labor ran the businesses. The weavers were always employees, subject to oppressive taxes, debt, and poverty, not glorified at all as the great craftsmen they were. Moorcroft's great knowledge of animals led him to believe he could send the goats of Tibet to England so they could have their indigenous cashmere shawl production. However, he put the males and females on different ships uh, that he brought down from Tibet. So the ship carrying the female goats drown, uh, sank, <laughs> leaving the idea of breeding the goats in England loot on the road. So, the queen, the sultan, and the adventurer left us shawls and shawl patterns that have allowed us to examine, determine a, a stylistic development of the cashmere shawl over time. We have seen that the shawl Tipu Sultan gave Thomas Astley was very simple with a large, empty, colored gold feel. William Moorcroft's designs for shawl show a progression away from simple sprig flowers of Tipu shawl to the paisley form that we are so familiar with, the angled seed pod, I guess you could call it. Um, and finally, we know Queen Victoria's shawl has an all-over pattern quite the opposite in design from the early production. So I want to show you this progression of the shawl's evolution rather quickly since we're running out of time, um, as a progression of a material object full of artful wonder and beauty. All of these shawls uh, that I'm going to show you are made in that tapestry weave I indicated before, the double interlock tapestry twill and all of them are made out of cashmere that comes from the Tibetan goats and antelopes. This one dates from 1730, uh, from the Mughal period, and here's a detail of it showing a, a more developed sprig than what you've seen before, a kind of mille fiore or many flower pattern. So this is a very early shawl, 1730. This is an unusual one with a tree of life shawl border uh, within each section, you see a kind of shawl, uh, almost paisley motif developing in 1780. This is another shawl border that dates from 1800. And it, now you see that the seed pod is beginning to form, it's beginning to tilt. <laughs> this is how you see the stylistic development of these things. Um, it's got quite a beautiful blue field, this one. So I'm just mainly showing you sections of them. This is a green uh, shawl, uh, very unusual. And you see the paisley is fully developed now, a uh, paisley pattern, and this dates from 1805. This is called a harlequin shawl because each section of it has a different ground color, white, black, pink, and blue. Um, and you see a more highly developed, more decorated paisley motif dates from 1815. And this is a paisley shawl with a completely woven um, and decorated interior field, which is highly unusual. It dates from 1810 and shows one of the motifs that you, we saw in Moorcroft's gesso patterns. Um, now we're getting into what is called the Sikh period of shawl design. The Sikhs ruled Kashmir from 1819 to 1846, I believe. And um, they must have really loved the shawls and they wanted them to become more decorated, more full in design. And this is one of the early ones from that period that probably dates from 1820. Uh, as you can see, it's no longer just a border, but now it has a gallery, and the center field has shrunk. <laughs> and in the uh, center field, you now have embroidered patterns that have been added um, to 
form a more decorative pattern. So as time goes on, the field of the shawl, the central blank field, is disappearing. So this, is, this shawl is really the apogee of Sikh period weaving. There is a red center still, but it barely exists. Instead of just one gallery above the main border, it has two. And the interior of the uh, middle section has yet another third one with more uh, embroidery in it. This dates from about 1840. This is a detail of the border of this shawl. And I think you can make out the um, arches, the Islamic style arches, and the columns that look like what you would find on a Hindu temple, and a kind of naga pattern, a snake pattern. Uh, it's one of the few that seems to have actually Hindu symbolism in it. Many people have commented on these late uh, Sikh shawls that they seem to have fractal patterns in them, very complex weave. <laughs> This is a square rumal seat shawl from 1845 with a really dazzling center, like an explosion um, of color. In 1846, as we noted before, under Queen Victoria, the Dagra prince took over, and the shawls changed character quite a bit. They became more pieced. The weavers were now being taxed and taxed and taxed. They were basically prisoners in Kashmir, they couldn't get out. Um, so their, their weaving was prized, but it was a terrible situation for them. Anyway, you see these shawls that are heavily pieced, um, like Queen Victoria's, and beginning to see that purple, which is an aniline dye. And this is another one from the Dogra period of the 1860s. And this is a detail where you see the patterns have gotten quite large. They're not as detailed and delicate as they were. This is um, a peacock shawl. If you look closely, you can see peacocks in the border design. Kind of hard to make it out, but you can probably see them. And here's a detail where you see facing to the right a peacock, which is uh, kind of circumscribed by a, a paisley pattern. This too dates from the uh, 1860s. And then finally, uh, the center of Queen Victoria's shawl from 1870s. We can enjoy the shawls for their terrific artistry, design, craftsmanship, unadulterated by thoughts of the world around them. The shawls evolved in a, sim a straight line, it seems, from rather plain cashmere shawls, long shawls with decorative borders, to more elaborate woven and embroidered shawls, then to piece shawls with big motifs, and finally shawls woven with embroidery and piecing throughout. The British were probably the first to start trading shawls through the British East India Company, the first capitalist corporation um, in the 17th century. Initially, the East India Company operated like a foreign company should, befriending the native population, trading locally, reaping benefits. But over time, that was not enough for them. Greed drove them to want to take over India and all its craft productions and reap all the benefits. War after war after war was fought like that against Tipu Sultan. The actual British government turned a blind eye. Corruption abounded. Each new regime in India was worse for the weavers who were imprisoned in their own towns as they were taxed for making beautiful things. In exchange for this rapacious behavior, the British had the hubris to copy the shawls and other products of India with cheaper machine-made items and sell them back to the Indians whose local industries were gone. By the 1870s, both markets were decimated. The wealthy and the poor no longer valued the shawls as they had. The Indian economy for handmade cotton and wool products was pretty much destroyed. But the British reached their goal of conquering the Raj and ruling India. Out of this story arose a nationalist movement under the leadership of Mahatma Gandhi, I believe to be the greatest politician and statement, statesman of all time, who led a nonviolent uprising against the British and won. And guess what his main goal was to bring back the cotton industry? So I leave you with his image spin. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
questions? Questions? Yes. Is there still a shawl industry in Kashmir? Pardon? Is there still the is the yes. still exists? Yes. Is it thriving? Uh, it's not thriving. Nothing's thriving, I would guess, in Kashmir right now. But um, if you go to Delhi and probably in Mumbai, you will find shawl merchants. I went to one in Delhi uh, about 15 years ago and uh, had all manner of new ones and then old ones that he was fixing up <laughs> and old, you know, and there were people in there buying them for their daughter's dowry. So the tradition continues. It's really interesting. Only the year tradition is now in India. <laughs> because they worked for women's dowries back in the day. Uh, so yeah, it's alive and well in India. I have another question. Yeah. I wonder, uh, does it require a lot of people or women to create one shawl, or is the weaving done by one person, and then the decorative part, like the embroidery is done by another? Well, for the very early ones, they were done on one loom. Okay. And then as um, the various rulers of India took over, they started taxing the businesses and the weavers more and more. So a more efficient way of producing them was to make them in pieces. So when you hit the seat period, 1820, they started carving up the pieces. So the borders were made in one place. The, um, well, the, the smaller borders were made in one place. The uh, larger pieces were made in another place. And, they were put together um, in that way. And they got more and more peace as more and more taxation. <laughs> so you see a kind of cruel, uh, you know, thing going on there. Yes? So when they do the type script weaving, do, do they have the drawing white underneath um, the, the bars? I can't hear you. When, when they do the type script weaving, do they have the, the drawing underneath um, the bars? Do they have to assign? The drawing, the drawing. The drawing pattern. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. Yeah, they would have us, uh, well, they actually have scripts for the shawls in existence. And there's a fellow in Toronto, maybe others, who have deciphered the scripts, <laughs> which is really interesting. And so they would call out, they would have somebody calling out what the weave, you know, what was supposed to be done. Um, almost like a draw loom kind of process, you know, later on. So it's very cool how they, uh, yeah, thanks, that's a good, great question. Okay. This, is, this is kind of very similar to, it's a little bit similar to the Chinese on tax free weaving. Do they have any connection, connections or um, connection between the tradition? Do they have any connections? Oh, the Chinese and Indian? Yeah, the Chinese type of tax free weaving. I have no idea. I haven't seen anything on that, but um, you know, the weave is quite unusual in the area. I, you know, there's really no place else near Kashmir where they use that twill weave uh, of that particular type. So, if it exists in China really early, it's conceivable because the trade routes were so big and wide that it's possible that it originated there. Who knows? It could have been that India took it to China. <laughs> I don't know. I, you know, that's a really good question. But if you find any other places where you, you know, you find an uh, ancient history of it, let me know because I'd be interested in that. Any other questions? Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.